fact, one of the things that really drew me to property opposed to shares, like shares, I felt the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. Whereas with property, the more I learned, the more I felt comfortable. You're listening to the She Renovates podcast. You're listening to She Renovates, the podcast for women who want to renovate to create an income and a life they love. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of She Renovates. So today I have Todd Sloan on as a, as a guest, and Todd is from Adelaide, and uh, he's a real estate agent, but he is also the host of a podcast called Property and Pizzas. Did I get that the right way around? Todd? Other way around, pizza and property. Very close, though. Pizza and property. Okay, so there you go. So two of my favourite things. So that makes him a pretty popular guest. So, Todd, do you want to just give us a bit more insight into um, who you are and what you do? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So I, I work as a real estate agent in South Australia. Um, actually, I work as a lot of things. So I, I'm a real estate agent. Uh, I started a podcast with a friend uh, about almost two years ago now, I think, as a little bit of fun, which just seems to have grown and grown. So I, I kind of work in the podcast space now, I guess, as well, and also very much an avid renovator myself. I've just finished a project, actually my first 10-day reno, which was uh, a much better idea at before I did it than when I did it. That that was painful, but very productive um, and just about to, to get into another one. So yeah, I guess agent renovator podcaster. Awesome. Awesome. And um, and do you have family? Yes. Yeah. So I've got, you mean like uh, immediate, like wife, kids, that kind of thing or? Yeah. 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 I, I don't have little ones yet. I do have like a, a little fur baby kooky just on the floor, actually right here. I can't, I don't think I can turn the camera down though. But um, otherwise, oh. it's it's just uh, me and my other oh. half, Bianca. And what breed is Kooky? Kooky is a chocolate lab, and she she's actually officially uh, at Pizza and Property <gasps> as CHO, which is our, our chief happiness officer. So whenever times are down, Kooky comes in, and she she does the job very oh, well. That's <laughs> so, just beginning, why do you do what you do? What is it that has you um, like? I I understand why you love podcasting because you know, I, I share the passion. But in terms of your journey with real estate, what is it that really draws you into that? I, I think if I really look back far enough, it's um it's probably around like playing with Lego as a kid. And I, I was obsessed with it. I'm a very obsessive kind of person. I, I still feel I'm probably misdiagnosed autistic or something. Like once once I focus on something, like that's it. Everything else just kind of like I get the Clydesdale blinkers on. And and real estate has very much been that focus for a long time. But I think um, like uh, with selling houses, you could tell me, Todd, I'll give you double the money that you earn now, even triple the money you earn now, but you got to sell vacuum cleaners. I couldn't do it. I might do it for a few months just to get some cash for that I'd probably put into another flip or something. <laughs> but otherwise, the passion isn't there. And and I've actually tried yeah. to tie this back a few times. And I, I think it comes yeah. to building houses as a little kid. There's there's some happy memories there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I also, I can remember as a child wondering, really being confused about the process of building a house, mm -hmm. trying to think through what would come, what would come first and what would come next. And, and, you know, just really being quite um, intrigued by it. So it is interesting that, um, that, you know, uh, that those so seeds are sown so early. Um, and it's something I think as parents that um, you don't have a lot of idea of how much impact you're having on your children, uh, which I know you don't have yet. Um, and it's something that it's becoming increasingly obvious to me as I see, um, you know, I see, you know, the way we have lived our lives as parents come back to us in our young adult children. So it's an interesting thing. Now, we're not really here to talk about parenthood. <laughs> um, I really want to talk to you about what's going on in Adelaide and as well as your reno. Yep. But um, so w I'm really interested to I like to get a feel for what camp you're in. Um, now, I think I've got a pretty good idea. So what I'd like to ask you is what are your three core beliefs around property? Three core beliefs. Okay. So as in like property investing or property buying for you to live in? Because they, they'd probably shift a little bit. Yeah. 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 Really around. 
Investing. Yeah. Investing. Okay. So for, for me, or ad- buying property. I think that's what we're talking about. Buy, okay. Well, for, for me personally, add value. If, if you can't add value, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm very much a sweat equity person. It's one of the things that really drew me to property opposed to shares. Like shares, I felt the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. Whereas with property, the more I learned, the more I felt comfortable. And then on top of that, I looked at it and think, okay, so you can invest in like a wonderful company like an Amazon, a, a Tesla, a BHP or whatever it is, but it, you, you're solely reliant on everyone else. You can't go down to BHP, down to the mine site and just like sort of, oh, I'll start digging a hole as well, guys. I'll add some more value. It doesn't work that way, but you can do that with property. And, and that was a really, really big one for me. The, the second one would probably be cash flow. I'm a very cash, like negative cash flow. And again, whatever works for, for everyone else. I know some investors that do tremendously well with like really negatively geared portfolios. If that's their bag. Fantastic. For me, I really like positively geared properties. I like something that's going to not only produce that income from where it's positioned, which we'll get into number three. I'm kind of skipping ahead, but also from being able to actually just week yeah. to week, actually get some more cash out of it as well. And then I suppose the third one is really about if you're going to hold on to something long term, make sure it's in a spot that actually makes sense. And and sometimes you can find like these all these three together. And I know some people will say that's the unicorn property and it doesn't exist, but they do. I know my, my first purchases, they definitely aren't. And I, I don't know why, but I still hold them, Like especially one in particular is very regional town. It's still gone up and it still made me money. But at the time I was on like $38,000 a year and I had, I had no idea what I was doing. So I very purposely got into such a low risk property that if everything went to the wall, I'd still be okay. So actually maybe my third is also, or can I have like 3.5? Yeah. Can I have a half of one as well? Cause it's like really risk yeah. management. Of course you can. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding it, you're out. If, if things really go awesome. wrong, I've sold for people before that it, this, this can end marriages if it's not done right. So have, have an out if everything goes to, to poop that you're both at an understanding or you and your partner, part, business partner, whatever. I think that's super important. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And especially with renovating mm. um, because, you know, usually you've maxed the value out of the property, you know, like you've, yeah, you've expended its value and it's worth, you know, it's at the peak of its value. So um you want to make sure that you've got a plan B if you don't achieve the return that you're expecting. Yep. So, yes, so my suspicions have been confirmed. We're completely aligned. Um, Excellent. I totally agree with your philosophies around that. And I think the other thing that sets property apart from shares uh, is the fact that you can get leverage with property in terms of a loan. Yep. Um, where shares, you know, it's not it's not so straightforward, and um, and yeah, so I think that that's another benefit. Tell us about the Adelaide market. Where exactly is your agency located? So the agency is located down south, um, but there there was a bit of a joke in the office a little while ago that I was the global specialist. Um, because everyone just kind of worked in their little patch. And it was one thing that, that I always looked at and thought, we're past that now. It's, it's tw- at the time, it was 2018 when I started kind of going, I think I can actually work a little bit more borderless. And now everyone in the office does it, but not just our office. I'm finding like so many more agents. It's not just about the thousand homes that are around you. So I, I've got listings, like I'm selling a penthouse in the city right now. I'm selling some, some waterfront property all the way down to Port Elliot. Like it's, it, actually, no, that one's not waterfront, but I, I'm selling all over the place. And, and I think you couldn't do that 20 years ago. Yeah. That was impossible. But um, yeah, very possible now. Yeah. And so when you say down south, where exactly down south? Uh, so it's in Christie's Beach. Where's you, where are you located? Well, Christie's Beach. Oh, okay. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great. And so what are you seeing happening in terms of the market? Is it as crazy over there as it is here? it's every time we think it's going to go like, okay, this is crazy. And, and then it's just like, okay, I must be at the top now. It just keeps going. Like there's, I've been selling a lot of entry level stock for investors. And it was actually, it was, someone was explaining it to me the other day. And I thought this is kind of a funny way to look at it is it's like, I, I've got a German heritage. So I've got a very strong European background and it's kind of like, there's been a family problem for 10 years that no one's talked about because nothing's happened in the market in Adelaide realistically for like 10 years. And all of the aunties and uncles and everyone's sitting around the table and one of them pipes up and starts talking, ah, what's going on here? And then you can see there's a little bit of tension now. 
And that's kind of what happened at the start of the year, like a little bit of a little bit of a jump. And all of a sudden, these $270,000 houses are worth like three thirty. And we're like, wow, this, this is pretty cool. But then one of the other aunties that's always had a bit of a problem, she pipes up. She's got to scream louder now. And now all of a sudden, we're, we're jumping up even higher again. And, and now it's just getting to the point where it's, it feels like stupidity. And everyone's just yelling at each other. And it's like, we need Oma to jump in, which is like, in my opinion, APRA in this story that I was told, which I think is kind of funny. We need APRA or someone to jump in to be like, whoa, 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 wait a second, guys. Like, we, we, we need to calm down because I'm all for growth. Don't get me wrong. Like, property investor, I want to see things go up, but it's the rate that it's going up. Properties we were selling for, for 300000 at the start of the year, we're literally now selling for four hundred and fifty. That's That's exceptional growth. And, yeah. and in some cases, they've almost doubled in the space of two yeah. years. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question or just tells a random story about aunties yelling at each other. No, but it does. And and um, is it Uma has stepped in? Yes, I think so. Now the the assessment rate's been raised now. Is that right? Like with yeah. APRA, I don't know if you've heard the news yeah, on that one. it has, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have. Yeah, so, um, so things will start to um, – so the buffer – uh, the affordability buffer has gone from. It's gone from. Oh, was it point three to point four? It's gone from two percent to to three percent. The the buffer. So it used to before. I believe it was in 2018, okay. 2019, They just used a seven point something percent return. Uh, not return. Uh, buffer, and and then they changed it to I think two percent above the standard variable, and now that's going up to three percent. So it's going to be around six percent, from what I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good thing because, um, yes, because unfortunately if it just keeps going like that, it will become a bubble if it hasn't already. And yeah. so, you know, you only need a little flicker in the interest rates to, to see things all go to, you know, the pack. Yeah. Are you seeing any renovation opportunities in, in your patch? Y- yes, but I feel like the tricky thing is... It's, it's the $64 million question, like when's the music going to stop? Because people that like at the start of the year that I was selling those properties for like 332, that we were thinking, wow, you, that's, you've, you've paid a premium there. And because and beforehand they would sell for like in the high twos. Now all of a sudden renovated, they're going to sell for close to half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's nuts. But at the time we thought they were paying the premium. So if it continues, yes, there are renovation opportunities. If it doesn't continue, no, everything's yeah. overpriced. Yeah. I always think in this sort of market, you really, the type of project you get really needs to be, you know, those dirty, disgusting, um, unlivable properties. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, uh, you know, as a renovator, you're usually stripping all that out anyhow, so it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But, um, and you've got more hope of getting it at the right price. I know I've got a couple of women who are just looking at their right, their project now. And it's, it's one of those. It's it's been on the market for over a year been in this market. Wow. So one of the problems is that the the vendor was expecting the same price as something that's not a hellhole. Yep. And um and has only just recently got realistic about their price. Yep. So um yeah, and that's you know we're talking a difference of two hundred thousand buy in price. Yeah. Wow. So um. Yeah, so if they, you know, if they, they get that, they will be fine. But if they pay the going rate for a three-bed, two-bath, then there's sort of, it's borderline whether there's any money in it. So, mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting market. I was just going to say, something else to, to just kind of add into that as well with finding one, something that I personally look for, and you, you, I'm assuming you'd probably do something similar, if not exactly the same, is I look for the opposite of what you'd sell like. If, if you want to run through like a perfect sales campaign and everything's beautifully presented, you've got a really good pricing strategy that's strong, your promotion's really strong, like don't look for that. Because that one is going to have amazing competition against you. Look for the one that's horribly presented, that's probably priced too high. And people are, oh, I don't want to seem like I'm cheap and offering that. It's like, no, 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 be fine with that. But again, it's look for the opposite of what you'd normally look for. And that's generally where the gems are found, I feel at least. Exactly. And because, of course, we, um, I'm not sure whether it's the same over there, although I did live in Adelaide for 20 years, I should know. Um, but uh, so if we pitch a property too high, in you know the sale price too high initially often that really is a death knell for the project or for the property because people start you know like 
it doesn't sell because it's overpriced and then people start to think there's something wrong with it. So once it's been on the market for a while. And so even in this market, you can get that that completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I find in this market, and like I only sell in South Australia, I haven't sold anything over on the Eastern seaboard, but if if something is, let's say even pitched at roughly where you think it's actually going to, to go and then you add that premium on top, We've, we've had that a few times where we thought, okay, things are getting crazy. The data says, let's say half a million, but we think maybe this is actually going to go around that kind of like 600,000. If you put it on at 600,000, everyone's now looking at it and adding the extra anyway and going, oh, well, I don't want to pay 700 or 750. And it's like, no, no, wait, we're trying to actually meet the market now instead of just using the data because that's historically how you should price a property is what's happened, not what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 a bit challenging, isn't it? Very much. Yeah, it's, it's challenging as a buyer, and I'm sure it's very challenging as an agent. So, you, you know, agents tread, and I think you've sort of touched on this a bit in your last response. But agents tread a very fine line when they're, um, you know, when they're selling property because um, most. Uh, vendors have unreal, you know, are emotionally attached to their property. And my experience is that they have quite high expectations of what they should get. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we buyers don't want to pay any more than we need to. So what does the agent tell you as a vendor? Do they say that they can achieve your expectation? Because if they don't, they're likely to miss out on the listing. And so from my experience, I've seen that they tell you what you want to hear and then spend the the campaign trying to get your expectations to meet what's your experience of that so what you're referring to depending on where it is can be told as buying the listing okay so let's let's say we're sitting down and and you and i were going to sell a project and and realistically let's say each property as the data says is like eight hundred thousand dollars each okay but you want a million so my first thing is is I'd be going through like the, the comparative sales analysis. I'd be looking at all the reports. I'd be going to all of the million dollar properties and straight away looking at this and going, well, Bernadette, this is what a million dollars looks like in this market right now. How do you feel that compares to your home? And if you can look at that logically and go, oh, wait a second, actually that's got an extra bathroom or that's got an extra bedroom or whatever it is that, that makes it up there, then fair enough. I look at that and go, okay, cool. I, I think we could probably work on this together. And but But if you all of a sudden go, no, no, they're identical. They are absolutely, and it's like, well, there, there are a little bit of differences here, yeah. though, Bernadette. We've got this, this, and this. As an agent, personally, and I can't speak for all agents, just myself, I want to see if someone is is at least on the page of realism, because if they're just completely pie in the sky, you do like that. That's your only other option is turn to the agent that just lies in the meeting, buys the listing, and then tries to beat them over the head with the price later. But that's also the agent that never gets a referral that is then tarnished as a liar. And it's just like, there's there's no point to doing that. I'd, I'd rather tell you what I don't think you want to hear in the beginning to then say later on to tell you something that I think you do want to hear. I think we're, we've just got some feedback from Leon Kuki here. Sorry, do you, do you mind giving me a second? She wants to be let out. I'm sorry, Bernadette. Give me two seconds. <laughs> well, that's interesting because that's um, that's certainly different to how things operate in my neighbourhood. Okay. How does it um, operate there? And... Well, often, um, oh, look, it may not necessarily, I don't think it's dishonesty on the part of the agent, but often uh, the, the, the sellers are very unrealistic about what they're going to get mm-hmm. and uh, there is a disconnect between the buyer and the seller. The other thing I wanted to ask you, so I'm basically finding out what goes on behind the scenes in case you haven't noticed. Yeah, yeah sure. The other thing that I notice is that, when someone asks an agent whether they should renovate their home, mm-hmm. more almost always the answer is no. And um, some story about, you know, the new owner will want to put their own touch on. And I believe that it's because they're concerned about losing the listing. Because if you go away and renovate it and then talk to some other agents, do you th- what do you, do you think there's any truth in that? Potentially, but I mean if if you really want to, then just list everything beforehand. Like a lot of my clients, I'll be talking with some of them for years, but like in, in one case, uh, one that we just got yeah. under contract this week, we've been working together since I reckon it was May, April around then. 
and, and everything was listed because there was a few off market offers that we got. And that's always the way that I'll approach things is it doesn't always go to market. So let's do the paperwork yeah. now. Let's get everything up and running and maybe we can just connect the dots off market. But I'll always break it into three different prices. You've got dream price, does the job price, and just like, okay, I'm happy with that one. So if you can get dream price off market, take okay. it. Yeah. But, but if you're getting down here off market, you're potentially leaving an extra 5, 10, 20% on the table. So that to me doesn't make any sense. Unless you're the buyer, then fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So that's something that we can add into our, um, into our scripts. Because um, I know, I've known of, you know, quite a few students particularly, the agents just said, no, 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 don't renovate it. When I know that that will make a significant difference to the sale price. And so, um, yeah, and I think that that's probably what's at the bottom of it. Can I make a suggestion? Um, yeah. Ask Let's them, make this a little workshop. Well, that's what I'm just thinking. Ask the, the agent what their experience is with renovating. Because maybe the reason they're saying no is because they just don't know anything about it. It's out of their comfort zone. And and I'm thinking that that could also be the reason why they're thinking, no, 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 just do it as is. Because if you start asking me more questions, I'm going to start yeah. feeling uncomfortable or not look like the pro anymore, but potentially. Because to me, it, it yeah. makes sense. Unless someone's yeah. going. Actually, that's that. Yeah. So un unless someone's maybe giving. Yeah, like I, I have actually said to, to one gentleman once, don't renovate it because I could see his standard of renovation was very not good. Just like that sentence was very not good. <laughs> but it, yeah. it, it was just like, mate, you, you're going to overcapitalize and do a horrible job. I didn't say that in those words, but that was more like I'm trying to protect you from yourself. Otherwise, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, okay. So what's the scariest or the funniest thing you've seen in your um property career probably the it was in my very first uh, very first sort of um year in real estate like in the sales side of things and it wasn't the scariest but it was the most like oh my god what do i do was um i had a call from a vendor and this was one of the very first houses i actually sold myself and that already moved up to queensland they were moving up to townsville i think it was and I got a, a random call from a lady walking a dog going, oh, hi, I just got your name from the signboard. I just wanted to let you know the hot water service on the roof is like gushing a lot of water. Um, and I was like, oh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll go and check. And, and so I went over there. I was like, oh, wow, it's like leaking like full on. Like it's like someone's just standing on the roof with a hose. And it's a beautiful two-story home. It really, really nice uh, part of town. Um, and, and then I called up the vendor straight away. And just as I was turning off the tap and I'm like, oh, get a car, just letting you know, told him the story. And he's like, no, 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 leave it on. That's fine. It's just because it's so hot. There's middle of summer. So it was like 40 degrees. It was like one of the heat waves. He said, there's some kind of heat release valve. And he's like, it's fine. When it's really, really hot, it just starts spewing out the, the hot water. So just leave the tap on. I'm like, okay, cool. I can do that. Anyway, so that was a week before settlement. The day of settlement, Carl calls me and he's like, Todd, you know, I've been thinking about that hot water thing. Do you reckon maybe it is a problem? I'm like, well, no, like you said, it was fine. It was just a hot water release thing. And he's like, yeah, but do you mind going to turn it off now? I'm like, that's fine. But we do settle today, Carl. And he's like, yeah, I've just had it on my mind. Just if you wouldn't mind turning it off. I'm like, all right, well, I'm, I'm meeting the, the buyers there literally at one o'clock today to, to do the, the key handover and everything. But I'll, I'll go there half an hour early and I'll, I'll turn it off. Anyway, way too late. I go there. I open up the, the front door. And this is why, seriously, get insurance, not just building insurance, get contents insurance for the, what I'm about to say now. Okay. And this is during the settlement because there's a gray period or a gray area. You own it, but you don't. And the vendor owns it, but they don't during the settlement period. When I walked in, the entire first floor had collapsed. All of the Jiprock were had fallen off of the, it, because that water had been leaking down the, the side of the house into the roof and just pooling all on the, the Jiprock on the first floor. And these guys were, they were beside themselves. Actually, he was okay. He kept it together. She was bawling her eye. I felt so sorry for them. And I had no idea what to do. I was completely wet behind the ears at this stage. So I just started saying, like, oh, let's call the insurance company together. Let's do whatever we can. Right, right. We turned it into a positive because they didn't actually like the kitchen. So it ended up getting them a new kitchen for free anyway. But that moment of walking into a house and seeing no roof where there was like a beautiful house only to like just beforehand, that, that was, that was a bit to deal with as a young agent. Sorry. Go. Oh, 
that's that's an incredible story. I'm glad I asked. So did you say that the first floor, the structure collapsed? Not the structure, all of the gyp rock, but I think they did have to replace certain parts because I think there was waterlogged because it was like a week of just like flooding. So it, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't good at all. Wow. Mm. Yes. Actually, I must admit, we make it a policy that we don't cancel the insurance until after settlement. Um, and I didn't think that you could insure it before it was your own. Yeah, absolutely. You want what's called um, a certificate of currency. Be, yeah, beautiful. Wow. That is incredible. So let's talk about renovating. Yes. So you've just done a 10-day renovation. Yes. Were, what were the wet trades in that renovation? Mm. So when you took the um, t- did you take tiles off the wall? No, no. So tiles, I'm just thinking who the wets were. Um, so we we actually used a, a thermo glaze uh, over the tiles. So for the bathroom, if we pre- sort of break it up piece by piece, the bathroom I had thermo glazed before yeah. because I didn't have the time to to do it. So in, in my my industry, if, if you were to take sort of six or eight weeks off, you basically just disappear. It, it's, it's not very good. So I thought we knew we only had this little yeah. two-week window. And um, so I got the, the tiles in the bathroom thermo glazed. But then the tiles in the the toilet, they were green, like hideous green. I don't know. I'm just picturing someone at a showroom one day years ago going, that looks good. Like, I, I don't know when that was, but it must have happened at some stage. But so we wanted all of those white, but I don't uh-huh. like painting. T- I don't know what your thoughts are, but I don't like painting tiles in wet right. areas. I think it's not a good idea. But when I found Thermo Glaze, and this is not a paid promotion or whatever, I don't get paid by them, but they, they gave a 10-year yeah. guarantee with their work. And I thought, 10-year guarantee, I'm, I'm down with that. Um, and so that was all sprayed, but I did paint the tiles in the the toilet just because they wanted another $2,000 to do that. And I thought, you don't touch the walls in the toilet. You're pretty much in and out of there. So I thought I, w- I was safe with that one. Um, we got the the tiler in. Yeah. Uh, what else? And that was basically just tiles um, and new vanity, new shower heads. It was a very quick fix kind of rental. I think it ended up costing about $4,000 all up. Uh, so did they painted all the the bricks externally, painted inside. Um, but we also had to fix up the kitchen in the granny flat as well because there was a kitchen there. I had to re-silicon all the the bathroom in there, and really otherwise it was just a lot of painting. Like I mean, a lot of painting. It was, yeah, pretty full on. And so you did all the painting yourself. Did all the painting apart from a, a couple of lads uh, that came up that were basically just like lackeys, kind of air tasker sort of style. They came through the uh, the property manager up there and and just paid them, um, yeah, just some money to to help out for a couple of days. But, but and what was the objective of your reno? Two things. Uh, one was so to, was it to increase the income? Both, so capital and um, also the income. Sorry. That's all right. So basically, uh, it's it's a deal where we there was already a three bed one bath on the front, and then we had a, a granny flat out the back as well. Now we're building another granny flat out the back behind that too, because it's quite a big block, so we could actually fit fit uh, all three structures on. But the granny flat that was existing and the three bed one bath that's existing is going to be went, rented out as as one structure. Okay, so for that one, that was going to be rented out or beforehand, it was rented out $290 a week, which was already a pretty big discount for where it is. Um, And then we basically got told if you can really spruce this up, give it nice, nice freshen up with the bathroom, kitchen, all the rest of it, new flooring, because we put new flooring throughout too. um, Then that was going to take things up to more around the 500s. By the time we actually got it done, uh, it's looking like it's going to be rented out for more like $580 a week. And, and then also the back granny flat that's about to be finished that should be rented out for around 350 a week so all up it should now bring in around 900 dollars a week in in cash flow um and the the other part of it was adding a granny flat at the back doesn't really do much for an equity uplift so i purposely wanted to get something that i could do a reno to because the as complete uh, vow actually came back terrible when we wanted to went to to finance the the granny out the back so I thought I need to make sure that I can impress the yeah. value over this and, and get a really good revow to pull some equity out. Awesome. And so so how much did your reno cost? I haven't done the exacts on it yet. How but, much did you spend on it? Uh, we, we see, I still haven't sat down to do the exacts because now I'm doing the budget for the next one. Um, but it, it's looking like it's uh, around sort of 26000 Okay, beautiful. So twenty six k, and you've you've increased. So you'll recover your ex, your expenditure in the first year 
more or less. Just actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. From the 290, yeah. So you've gone from 290, that's 600 a week roughly, and that's close enough to 30K. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, pretty happy with Epic. that. Epic. And um, where is it? Do you mind me asking? Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not allowed to say. I used a buyer's agent and that was their only stipulation. They're like, Todd, you've got a microphone that talks to a lot of people. Really? Yeah, they're oh. like, I don't want to talk areas. And I was like, that's fine. I'll, I'll respect that if yes. that's your IPO. No worries. Um, okay. So what were your biggest learnings and what are your tips for renovators? My biggest personal learning on that one is I need to stop telling myself I'm still 21 because it that hurt. Like it was me and my other half and we're both in our mid thirties and it was, it was 14 to 16 hour days, 10 hours, uh, 10 days straight. So it was, it was very full on. And I used to do those kinds of hours all the time, like physically, like working underground in the mines, I would do 12 hour days and that's just how it worked. That apparently now hurts a lot more when you're 35. So underestimating the need for recovery partway through like I did an ice bath partway through that really helps just with the body it's like 10 okay. minutes of horribleness but then that that was really good afterwards um the the other thing is the the actual coordination I'm very much just get in there and just start doing things like I'm a high like creative person Whereas my other half, Bianca, she's a lot more sort of organized system structures. And it's why we, we complement each other really, really well. Like she's still very creative, but that's definitely more of a strength. So she brought a lot of that. And I think that's something that I need to get much better at. Because when you're just doing one or two renos, you can keep a lot of it up here. But if you want to expand that and expect other people to know what the hell is going on, you can't expect them to read your mind. And I think that's a bit of what, what I need to really yeah change around. Exactly. And particularly, are you finding trades hard to get at the moment? Surprisingly not, but I think I might have just got a bit bit lucky. I really lent on the property managers and and yeah, I had them there literally within in a day. So but I, I was fully prepared for that to take okay. longer. Well, that, that, yeah. 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 Okay. Well look, congratulations. That's really awesome. And that's true that scheduling your work is um it's it's critical, particularly when, or more so when your trades are uh, time poor, because you know they've got to slot you in along with you know however many other people, and yeah, so um, yeah, so anything else? That's Any right. great products? Uh, I love thermograde too, by the way. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, um, his name's Todd as well, so I can't forget his name. Um, but probably the other thing, uh, what was it? <laughs> Okay, you might know this one, or you might have talked about it, but Shoreline Edges, they're six bucks, the best $6 you'll ever spend uh, when you're painting. I, I remember the very first time I used it, I don't drink anymore, but I used to drink quite a lot. And I, I think I had a few too many drinks when I was painting my apartment in my early 20s. And I put way too much paint on it, put it on there, and it just spilled paint. And I was like, this thing is rubbish, chucked it in the bin, never thought anything of it. And, and it was actually a friend of a friend two renos ago that's like, you've got to try that Shoreline thing. I was like, no, 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 they spill paint everywhere. And he's like, how about trying it not after a few drinks, Todd? And I did. You can cut in a whole room in like 10 minutes. <laughs> it's Seriously, it's incredible. And and watching Bianca just like fly around cutting everything in, they've just absolutely cut your, your time down. Actually, that's probably another tip now that I'm, I'm thinking about it. Pull apart a job and look at all of the steps involved in it and then take out the ones that are completely unnecessary. If And this is only if you're trying to do it time-wise because there was a few things that – I didn't do dodgy, but I didn't do like amazingly well. Do, do you know what I mean? Like it's, and that's where you, you kind of have to do that and have to cut around a few bits and pieces that you might like to go, oh, actually, I'd rather do that absolutely perfect. But it's like, no, actually 80% is okay. It's not going to break and it's not going to hurt anyone. But yeah, doing that in that 10 day window only happens by, by taking a few unnecessaries out, I think. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting. I, I I don't paint anymore, but when I did paint, I was a very messy painter. So I could never get on with those things either because yeah. I'd get paint on the wheels yep. and yeah, there would be no clean line. So, um, so I just gave it up completely, but yes, I think that, um, yes. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so is there anything I haven't asked you? Um, I suppose there's lots, I of stuff. Um, lots of stuff we haven't talked about, but um, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty open book. Um, we talk about anything Renault. So, I mean, the, the next project coming up, 
Um, but that one, I think I might actually. Oh, good. Yeah. Good yeah. I think the the intent is to actually uh, turn this one into to a PPR because as of now, like I, like I, I guess I kind of alluded to before, I I had a lot of too much fun in my twenties. And I, I was paying for that for a long time. I had an accident on a drill rig, but that's a whole other story. Um, but it was in my late twenties, early thirties that I thought I've got to get things back together. And so I actually just went into sacrifice mode and actually just moved back in with family in my early thirties and, and just went, look, this is all I'm going to do. I'm just going to put everything into property. And I went from having a portfolio worth 300 grand to now I think I've built it up to 1.7 million, which is like, I, I'm really happy with that in the space wow. of, uh, I think four years. So I, I'm now finally looking at it going, I think I'd like a little PPR. So I've just got this little unit, but I can't help but like, I have to still buy with this, like my head, not my heart. So this one, whilst it's going to be a PPR, it's also a project that I want to make good equity on. So I've just sold a unit uh, for three, yeah. 321,000 uh, identical to this one. That one was renovated and I just purchased this one for 225. So it, there's a hundred grand gap in between the two. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, let's, wow. yeah, let's wow. just get stuck into that. Yeah. I think your PPOR is, um, you know, you know, the, is it Robert Kiyosaki that goes on about it being, you know, your, your family home is not an asset, but I think if you, if you're um, what's level headed about it, that you can make it an asset and the great thing about it is um, that if you do sell it, you don't pay tax on the on the growth. Um, so I, you know, like we we often have people come to us and they've not bought anything yet, and they're saying, "Will I buy a house myself, or will I buy something else?" And I'm always saying, "Well, look at it. If you buy something for yourself, you don't have to live there forever because you can sell it and pocket the the growth." But if you buy an investment property and you're not happy with it, yeah. then you're paying rent out of after-tax money and you get taxed on any growth on that property. So for us, it's been um, it's always been a good thing. And we decided to downsize oh, about eight years ago now. So we bought where we live now before we downsized just to get into the area yeah. because I was thinking it was going to grow. And we bought a um, a warehouse, and the one of the things that I wanted to make sure was that it had some capacity for income because, mm-hmm. you know, like living in the centre of Sydney, you've got a lot of money tied up in your principal place of residence, and I yep. wanted to make sure that we had some earning capacity in it. So we rent out our ground floor, and that returns about 50000 a year. That's awesome. And so, and the other thing is that, yeah, I know. It's incredible. And the other thing is, so we paid, when we bought it, we paid $1.3 million. Every year since we've owned it, it has gone up at least 200000 And, it, like, we've owned it for eight years now. And the agent told me the other day that properties around us now are selling between four and $5 million. So <laughs> this is a property that we paid $1.3 for. Yep. And they're houses. They're not warehouses. So... You know, um, I am all for PPOR and buy it in the best area that you can um, Mm -hmm. because um, it is for saving and, um, yeah, so anyhow, yeah, so there you go. So that's, um, yeah, that's it. So I I think that we um, we have a few gems in our episode. And I'm really um, happy to have had you, Todd, because um, I love your style and um, I think that our audience will really enjoy listening to you. Um, if anyone wants to hear more, pizza and property. But I see you celebrated your 100th episode. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We had uh, Chris Voss on the show, which was um, pretty amazing. He's a, uh, yeah, a, an incredible man. Has achieved um, so much in what he's uh, done in his career, both in the corporate world and in the FBI as a hostage negotiator. So very, very fun talking to him. Okay, yeah, I've read his book, Don't Split the Difference. Yeah. Or Never Split the Difference. N- Never Split the Difference, that's the one. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I must go over and listen to it. I've got a bit behind. So, well, look, thank you for making the time. Um and I'm sure that um, quite a few of our listeners will be keen to get over there and, and listen to your 
um, brand of entertainment mixed up with wisdom and property. And, yeah, that's it. We'll see you all next week. Thank you so much for having me, Bernadette. Just one last thing. Todd has kindly offered to give away some copies of his book and it is entitled Australia's Home Buying Guide. I'm sure there'll be lots of tips in there for anyone. Now, what we'd like you to do is if you could promo out on Instagram, if you could um, share that and tag uh, Pizza and Property in that as well, and we'll get in touch with you and get your details. And Todd's very kindly going to send those books out to you. If you want to meet up with a group of savvy renovating, I shouldn't say it's all women because it's not, savvy renovators, I'll say, come over and join She Renovates. It's completely it's free Facebook group and it is growing at the rate of knots. We hit a thousand members just recently and now it seems to have picked up momentum. And so they are all savvy renovating women and men that are working their little hearts out to live a better life through renovating. Join if you're not already a member and then ask, comment and do whatever you would like to do in order to further your renovation journey. And that's it for me today. So I'll see you next week. This is the She Renovates podcast. To discover how to harness the power of renovating, check out theschoolofrenovating.com.